What's up, squadron? Aviation has given me a ton of amazing experiences. And more importantly, it's introduced me to a whole new family of friends. Join us tonight, because we're clear direct for some hangar flying. I'm Ryan Dombrowski, and this is Super Arrow Live. What is up, <laughs> Skyfam, Super Aero Squadron, Avgeek friends? It's Wednesday, 8.30 Central, 1.30 Zulu, which eventually that's going to change, right? But anyway, uh, so excited to have you tonight, Super Aero Live. Uh, if you haven't seen last week's episode, we've got kind of a home-building thing going on this month. We had Elliot a couple weeks ago. We got Charlie teaching us about how to build planes. And now we're going to talk about vintage and experimental aircraft tonight with our guest Kevin. Uh, before we do that, obviously guys, share the episode, subscribe, all that stuff, and a big thanks to everyone who's supporting this channel on Patreon. Uh, broadcasting from your basement is cheaper than the studio, but it's not free and you guys help make this possible, so I really appreciate that. But let's cut to the chase right away. I know some pokes in, folks in the chat <laughs> um, <laughs> were complaining that we're running a little late. We had some technical difficulties, but we got them worked out. Uh, Zach, 782 Papa, Experimental Aircraft Channel, all you guys in the chat, we see you. We're excited to chat with you guys tonight, but let's get right into it. Guys, Kevin Quinn is here. How are hey, you, Ryan? Kevin? Nice, to have, nice, to, thanks, nice to be here, and thanks for having me. Dude, it's awesome to have you. I'm so excited. Uh, you are, I mean, I'm a, little, I'm a little starstruck right now. I've been following you for a long time, and I've seen all the great... Uh, content you're putting out all the time about well we're going to talk about it all tonight but I just want to thanks thank you so much for reaching out uh, to me a couple times and then we can kind of like chat about it I'm just super pumped oh super super pumped to be here and uh, I appreciate what you're doing I think uh, this whole deal super arrow I mean man what an awesome opportunity I'm humbled to be part of it and thank you wow that's I'll send you the $20 bill in the mail later for that <laughs> <laughs> so okay so what i did so I, I can't imagine people don't know who you are because you're kind of a kind of you you joked when we talked on the phone the other day you said like i'm an influencer i don't even know what that means but you are you're out there people know you but if they don't uh and i want to apologize to your wife a little bit i uh, you're like what um i think you said if it weren't for your beautiful family i think i've created the perfect dating profile intro for you. <laughs> Hang in with me. Hang in with me. So here's your beautiful family. Uh, I wish you get like my announcer voice on. Like Kevin Quinn is a as a family man who loves adventure. <laughs> There's you guys flying. Oh, we skipped past it. There's you guys flying as a family. You got this beautiful. Well, that's you in a helicopter. There we go. Come on, technology. There we go. Look at you guys, like flying as a family. You got the dog. You got the kids. Adventuring. Even the golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, they're like, uh, born and raised on a mountaintop, Kevin uh, started a heli skiing operation, and that's super epic. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna lose the voice. But here's the deal. Like, look at this. Look at this. Look at your life. Uh, Kevin Quinn. This is your life. Uh, yeah. Mountaintops. Uh. Helicopters, lucky. Like, and then there's like this. Like, is that you? That's me right there. That uh, my heli ski life has has been something. I've had a heli ski operation in Alaska, Points North Heli Adventures, uh, AlaskaHeliSki.com. Selfish, shameless plug there. For the last uh, 23 years, this is our 24th season in Alaska. For those that are skiers in the audience. Uh, we've been part of the Warren Miller ski movies for the last, gosh, 17, 18 years. And I feel really lucky because they've been able to document our business, document the growth of our business over time. And yeah, this is me a handful of years back skiing this big line. This is really probably like one tenth of what you're really seeing and, and what I'm standing and skiing over there. But, you know, I always say the only way to quantify it is it's steeper than hell. And that's a line that is, it's steep, it's a no-fall zone, but when conditions are right, you know, and everything lines up, you get to, you know, access peaks like this. And I like to say, you know, anything's obtainable, but 
you got to practice and you got to train to get to that point. And this was sort of a, a highlight point, pinnacle of my ski career, so to speak. And, you know, this is something we fly by every winter when we go out there and I stare at it and I still get sweaty palms and I wonder mean, if I, the conditions are right. And it's, it's a beautiful line. This is called the fin. Uh, just off a run we call the Sphinx, the mighty Sphinx. And uh, this is a big fin just down the ridge that's 1,800 feet sustained. You're looking at about maybe 400 feet there. But it's, you know, it's another 300 feet above me and almost 1,000 feet below me down to the heavily glaciated uh, terrain. But, yeah, this is another part of my life. And my heli ski operation has provided, you know, things that I feel very extremely grateful for to where we are now with flying. And then I have this other life where we surf and we spend a lot of time in Hawaii. And it's kind of silly where my surf friends don't really know my ski life. My ski life don't really, it doesn't really know my flying life. But... You know, if I can encompass all of it, I, I'm a big believer in trying something new every day, trying to learn something new all the time. And life is what you make it. You know, you got to immerse yourself in life. And, and I try to instill that in my family, my kids. And you live hard, you play hard, and you slide all the way into home, beat up, bruised, and battered. And that's probably when the lights go out, you know, and that's how I look at it. It's you got to be smart and responsible. And, you know, life is what you make it. I just, I mostly put in those photos because those are like all the things that terrify me, like skiing, the water, kind of, <laughs> like, like, I don't know. I was just really impressed. You sent me all this stuff like here's these other things, the hella skiing thing. We could do a whole show on that if we, yeah. if we had another time, but so that, so there's this stuff, you're just like, you're like adventure man, yeah. basically I, paramotoring I, with skis. Yeah, that's that's our Alaska stuff. I mean, you got a fan on your back. My my friends call it the butt fan. I just like putting that thing on when it snows here and go up and down the driveway and go around the neighborhood. Cause well, why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> I mean, I want to do that. We had we had uh, Eric Farewell uh, Aviator PBG okay. on there, and he he did a good job. I mean, I was dreaming paramotors for like three weeks after that. But well, I have a, a mini story real quick with Eric. It, I'd come back, I'd come from a skydiving background, we fly our speed wings in Alaska, and I called Eric and said, hey, you know, I, I want to get one of these paramotors, and he, and of course, doing the Oshkosh stole demo stuff, the aviator crew does all of that at Oshkosh after we're doing our stole, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, I got to have one of these, these are incredible, yada, yada, and we didn't know really each other, he didn't know me from Adam, and he says, you got to promise me you go get training first before you go out and use this and so anyway i went down to blackhawk paramotors in sacramento learned how to use it called eric and said hey i got a handful of hours i gotta have one of these and eric sold me one and the rest is history but man the access that you have you know coupled with the skis you've got a wing over your head now we're flying i love aviation and why not have one of those and so uh yeah it's an awesome opportunity to, to fly another another form of aviation i will add that to my list <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out of time. I don't know how you get all this stuff done, Kevin. You got all this stuff in your life. So, okay, so there's that stuff. But then this, I think, is what people know you for. Landing airplanes on top of mountains and places that airplanes Oops. wouldn't normally <laughs> land. This is our crew. This is the Stoll Rat crew, uh, a.k.a. Stoll Rats. It's... The Red Bluff crew, and uh, this, you know, you can recognize a number of airplanes there from the Trent Palmer, Red, White, and Blue Kit Fox, Jake Bunting over there in the black uh, Cub upper left, and then Chad Russell's Legend Cub, the AmeriCub. You can go all the way around the circle, Tony with TK Shocks. Uh, I think we got uh, Dooley, the world famous Dooley Vanyo there. I think that's his Cub. I'm not 100%. And then, I mean, it just keeps going around Brian Bowen and and everybody that's in that circle right there are, are the folks that we fly with on a daily basis. I believe I see Ty Ferkins, uh, Kit Fox up or right there next to Trent's. Um, and these these guys are, these guys, literally, they're my mentors. They're the people that I look up to and fly with. And, you know, I, I'm just a pilot, literally. And, and, you know, I feel like I've got some experience. These guys all have a wealth of experience. And we all get together. We push each other. We feed off one another. And, you know, it's a great group of folks, and, and these are the folks that I that I try to associate and fly with on a daily basis. These are my bros right here. It's such a cool like support group of people that you have. No, like, don't don't do that picture right there. That's dangerous. Okay, we'll skip past that one. You <laughs> sent you sent it to me. Uh <laughs> it's, it's another aspect of flying, and people, you know, trying to change our ways as we get older. 
<laughs> That's fair. Uh, this one, I wanted to put this one in, one, because it's a beautiful shot, but two, I think this photo here, I mean, there's a, we're going to talk a lot about the adventure, like, stole pilot stuff and talk to people yep. about about ways they can apply that to their flying, but I think this photo here, like, this feels like more of why I was excited to talk to you is because there's this idea of, like, and right now, in my the point I'm in in my life, it's more of a fantasy, right? Because I got these two little kids running around. They're not much younger than your kids, though. Uh, yeah. But but they're like you've got the family off adventuring in this bush plane, like that. I think is why. That's the allure of the. I, I think stole flying is really popular right now. People are really yeah. into it. I think, but I think this photo kind of like exemplifies why that is. It's, you know, this in particular, this, so I have this Insta360 camera, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and it comes off, you know, I literally, people ask, how do you attach it to that? And so being profile, high profile, et cetera, and always trying to put photos out there and inspire folks to go fly. They, I called the FAA and said, how can I put these cameras on my airplane and, and feel legal about it? Cause I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, right. And he said, hey, as long as it doesn't interfere with the flight control surfaces, you know, you can put these things wherever you so choose. It's an AC Go GoPro mounts on various aspects of different airplanes and whatnot. But the Insta360 has this pole, and I just attached it with uh, the grip lock ties. It sticks out about four feet. You can't see the pole in particular, but it makes this, this crazy image to where people write all the time, oh, my God, the drone pilot must be amazing. I'm like, yeah, that's my <laughs> trend. You should see him. That's why he's so good. But... The harsh reality is that these Insta360 cameras literally capture such good content. And of course, in that photo, I'm flying with my little girl, Kinley, there, who loves to fly. And, you know, I, I like flying light and by myself, and I'm going to do silly things, landing on mountaintops and whatnot. But both my kids, and they love to fly, and, and I try to get them involved as much as I can. Here we are, just Tahoe Sunset, enjoying the, the beauty of it, and, you know, literally just following up on what you just said. This... This is pretty much why I fly right here. There's there's nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. I mean, super incredible. This is funny. This whole slideshow, I was like, I'm going to like plow, plow through this in 30 seconds, make a little joke about how Kevin's like the rena aviation renaissance man. But like, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting into it, which I love. I was I just put this in here. Like, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. There's Well, we're going to talk about this and one other really cool new thing in your life. But this, this is, I think, the dream, right? Like landing on... This is this is almost ten thousand feet, just over nine thousand feet out uh, in the desert of Nevada. And like ski lines, we travel around looking for places to land. That ridge top in the background there. Uh, I was with two buddies in particular this day, Bruce Graham and my buddy Bill Holmes. Uh, Bruce had come out from Colorado in a new FX3, and you know he's experienced to this high elevation stuff, but really only about three months worth because he came from uh, the commercial airlines, retired captain of twenty some years. And he wanted to come do some off airport high density altitude flying, which I consider sort of a specialty for myself. Just that's where we fly high density altitude every single day. And of course, a freak trying to find cool places to land. And, and this is what this is. This is this is literally up at, I want to say, 9,500 feet or so density altitude. You know, you can add a thousand or two to that. And of course, the backdrop is all of Nevada. And, and I jump out and take a picture. That's my instant reaction when I get out. It's Hooray! Because man, oh man, that's how you feel when you get out there. It's it's an incredible place, incredible spot. I feel like when I eventually get to try this, I will mostly just be concerned about not being able to breathe. <laughs> Everything you do is so high up. <laughs> I uh, went to Red Rocks once, and I was like, thought I was gonna die. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's it is it's high. We had. Uh, Oh, we had our buddy Brian Wallstrom with the Experimental Air Traffic Channel, which you probably saw his episode a, a few weeks back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we land, and I said, we got to go up here and get a picture. And he's like, oh, you know, he's from sea level. And come on, let's go. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It was awesome. And so at any rate, yeah, we're, it's high altitude flying. Density altitude is through the roof. And, of course, there's a, a whole lot that goes in behind the scenes there for training and staying proficient with such. But that's where we fly on a daily basis. I think that's... And I, I get off on landing on mountaintops. Yeah. <laughs> I could see why. Uh, and thanks for tuning in, uh, Mr. Experimental Aircraft Channel. Sorry, I have to go catch the rest of the episode. Uh, we'll talk. We're, now that you, he left, we can talk. We can talk crap we about talk, him. Now we can talk about him. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I guess we're we're committed to the slideshow. Let me get the last two photos. I mean, I think the other side of it is like just landing places that even you know, like I can't even put my Cessna here, right? Or uh, I don't even know what I have. This is, this is kind right of a here. little spot we call the watering hole at uh, the Turner Ranch. And of course, you jump to this photo. Sorry, I'll wife. go back. I'll go back. Okay, yeah, that's the Turner Ranch. Uh, my buddy Merrick Turner is a uh, sixth generation uh, Turner, and he owns a large portion of the Sierra Valley. And uh, we've got oh dozens upon dozens of landing spots there. But this is a place that we always go and try to get the reflection shot. I can't tell you how many people have gone. We line up the airplanes. The water's kind of low in this one, but again, we're always after that cool aspect of flying and a big part of it is grabbing a picture so that you can post it and share it with someone and you know you said earlier this whole uh oh what is it called uh what am i an influencer i guess you know what is that i i like to post pictures and my passion is flying since i was a little kid and the only reason i i take these pictures is so i post them online so hopefully it inspires someone to come out and go fly with us or go fly themselves. And I, you know, you'll notice on all these photos, I always try to, to put something where, Hey, I want to see your pictures, put it out there because I get inspired by their pictures and, Oh man, that's a cool reflection or that's a really neat mountaintop. And, and so that's the only reason I put this stuff out there. And, and now we have this social media presence and it's grown into so much stuff to where there's a responsibility with that as well. Safety is a big part of my life. If I sent you my resume, whether it's teaching avalanche courses or wilderness medicine or backcountry flying, uh, ski guiding in the big mountains or dealing with avalanches in real, real life scenarios, I'm passionate about the safety, the training aspect of it. And uh, it's really what makes me tick. All this other stuff is just, you know, the, the, the glamour, so to speak, to put it out there to hopefully inspire folks. Well, thanks for hanging with me with, my, with that. That was a good intro to you. That was a good like. We did we did that we did that in like like ten minutes of like boom Kevin Quinn the biography, but so so two things before we move on one is I know there's a lot of questions in the chat and guys we're gonna have, we're gonna have time to ask questions Kevin some questions in a minute but uh, I noticed that Gabriel. And I don't, I don't think I can even pull, it's so, you guys are asking so many questions and chatting so much with each other, which is awesome. I can't even get to it anymore to put it on the screen, but Gabriel Dubrell, did I pronounce that right? Probably not. Uh, got his private pilot ticket. Oh, yeah, you, just, you passed your private pilot, so everyone give him a round of applause. I think you already did, but good job, buddy. That's awesome. And uh, hopefully we'll see in the skies around here sometime. Um Speaking of questions, I think this is maybe the next place we should go. A couple people have asked this. Ryan Krieger just asked it, so I'll grab his. He says, what inspired you to start flying? Like, So we've got like the overview. Like, Here's Kevin. Where did you, How did you start all this, man? You know, I was, I was raised in Alaska. I, you know, I usually, to save conversation, I just tell folks I was born and raised in Alaska, but I was born in Newport Beach, Southern California, moved to Alaska when I was three, four months old. Uh, my father has been a pilot since I can remember, uh, and literally just bouncing around the back of his airplane. Uh, we have some very, very close ties to Alaska. I mean, my, it's my entire life. I'm 50 years old, almost 51 now. Uh, people that I call that are my family, they aren't by blood, but I was raised there at Lake Hood, uh, the west corner, southwest corner, and it's over there where the Airman's Museum is, Branham Adventures. Well, Chris Branham, Dennis Branham. Dennis is the second. He's passed now, but he's guide number two behind Hal Waugh and his six buddies that created the Alaska Professional Hunters Association. Well, Dennis moved to Alaska before it was statehood. He's been flying all over the place. He started Rainy Pass Lodge and Hayes River. They went out and named all the lakes and whatnot. But this was my neighbor. His son was my father's best friend. And to be able to be exposed to this aviation family, Dennis literally grabbed me when I was three years old. I bounced around in the back of his airplane. I bounced around in all of the various Branham uh, members of that family and their aircraft and those folks. And one thing leads to another. One in three people in Alaska have an airplane, and that's what you did to go fishing. You went hunting, did whatever you were doing, rock collecting, duck hunting, etc. every single weekend. And so I would look forward to the weekend to be able to get in my dad's Super Cub and and go flying. I learned how to fly in a helio career and, and spent tons and tons of time in one of those as a little kid. And, you know, to say what inspired me to fly, I think the, the, the long-winded answer is that just growing up and being around it, 
I became passionate about it. And really, you know, I didn't become passionate about it until sometime in my 30s, really, because I went on to this other life of skiing. I played some real high, ice hockey, played professional hockey until I was about 24, 25 years old. I had this thing, you know, grass is always greener. Oh, I'm fighting and playing hockey all the time. Lost my feet, teeth. My nose is crooked. And uh, I was riding the buses going all over the place. And Hence, I find myself in Tahoe, and, and my ski life is taking off again, and my hockey's sort of fading because there's always somebody younger, tougher, stronger coming up the pipe. Well, I end up starting this heli-ski operation, being around all this aviation stuff in Alaska with uh, fishing and hunting lodges and stuff, working as a packer in the summertime, and, and just doing that sort of thing. And, and next thing you know, aviation it starts to become full circle where, oh my God, I have this heli-ski operation, and... I got my very first airplane, my second season in business to where I had these lifetime passes trying to figure out how in the heck am I going to get out of debt. I started this business and now I owe more money than I've ever made in my entire life. And I have this sure. gentleman that shows up and says, you know, I've got a really good deal for you. My dad has 10, 12 different airplanes and I've got this 182 I'm thinking about that I'd love to trade you, you know, one of these five-year passes for 182 and of course I close the door I'm like well I, I give them the hmm maybe I should think about that and I close the door and I look at everybody I'm like are you kidding me what's the give me an airplane we're high-fiving and I open the door yeah I think we could do sort of a deal like that and so at any rate that's how I obtained my first airplane and, and it just started to evolve from there and I started to get more serious and serious about it and so I mean I flew since I was a little kid, got my license at an early age, lost my license, which we don't need to talk about in my early 30s for flying that broken 182 out of the backcountry. And, and I learned a whole lot about one eight or FARs and, and rules and regulations. And, you know, as we get older, like I say, I'm almost 51 years old now, life becomes very much more responsible. Now you think, you know, to backtrack. I start to enter my late 30s, early 40s. All of a sudden, you're starting to think about kids. And now my heli-ski operation is has got itself out of debt. We're making some money. Things are being able to be paid off. And life is all of a sudden unfolding in front of me. And, uh, you know, with that comes responsibility, comes a little maturity. I hate that word, maturity. But that's that's the reality. you got to grow up at some point. Mm -hmm. you got to be responsible. you got to take things seriously. you got to be safe about it. And it just continues to evolve to where, you know, I'm, I'm so passionate about the safety aspect of it and, and, you know, trying to make good pilots better. Now, you know, almost 9,000 hours of off airport time and, and flying and flying as many different airplanes as I possibly can. And, and you saw photos with my aviation life doing so many things, you know, I don't mean to be so long winded, but that's kind of the story on how. I really got into flying, and, and now it's all that I do. I live and breathe it every single day to where, you know, I feel very, very lucky. I just sold my heli-ski operation this last spring, hence the Stearman, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. And I know, uh, you're, I, know you're, I know you're pumped to talk about it. <laughs> I, just, I, feel, I feel so, so lucky that, you know, I get it all the time. How did this ever work out? How do you afford to have three airplanes and I didn't, you know, 10 years ago, I could barely afford an airplane, let alone lunch. And, mm -hmm. and I tell people all the time in their thirties that are struggling, their forties, their fifties, it doesn't matter if you stay the course, you focus, you challenge yourself every day. Don't ever grow up. Try, try, try hard to be that kid every single day you can, but you got to be responsible with that and live the moment, live the part, and things will evolve and things will happen. If you want to be an astronaut, go hang out with astronauts. Why can't you mm -hmm. be an astronaut? If you want to be the best fisherman, then go to the river every day, hang out at the fly shop, learn how to tie fly. I mean, immerse yourself in it. You know, you want to be the guy that, that does the best podcast aviation show in the world, get it and get it done and, and like live it, dream it and make it happen. And things then fall in suit thereafter. And, and so again, you know, I just feel very lucky. I'm not trying to do any of this. It's just, it happens because you have to immerse yourself in all aspects of it and it works out. And I know it's harder for others than some because of so many different things, especially with the world that we're living in right now. And, you know, prayers to all those folks that are working two and three jobs and dealing with life. Yeah. And then they got to come home and deal with kids that can't go back to school. And, and that's very, very real. But do your darndest to stay positive because negative is so heavy. Positive is really yeah. light, you know, and it's really hard to stay positive. 
and the negative can drag you so hard, but if you can kick that negative to the curb every single time you, you think about it and try to do something positive and live in that moment, I'm just, I'm such a believer, you know, people ask, are you religious? Well, yeah, I believe, I believe in God, absolutely, but I, you know, I, it's, I believe in, I believe in everything, and I believe in the power of positive thinking, and uh, you live and breathe it, things, things good will happen to you. And there's so much in that message that, uh, <laughs> sorry, I mean, this made me laugh. Zach Sherman says, motivational speaker mode activated. Um, <laughs> and, that, and that's not my point. That's just, but that's just me. No, that's no, no, I think it's great, man. I mean, I think the biggest thing that, like, what hit me the most just now as you were speaking about that was that I have this overwhelming like for me, it was like, oh man, I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old and I'm 38 and I'm out of time. Like it's going to, like the clock is going to, eh, like it's going to like, like I'm going to be dead tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's part of that message that you were saying about in terms of patience, right? Like Happens. just do the grind, be patient and it'll come. And maybe, and I think the truth is, it's not always going to come like, maximum right but it's gonna like something you're always gonna find it i that's i don't know that's what i that's why i keep telling look, myself you gotta look for the little positive you know yeah. i mean maybe your last show had had more people than they've ever had maybe tonight you get aopa to share this channel you know i don't know maybe all of a sudden neil armstrong's watching and you're gonna do him next week and Maybe some big sponsor comes on because they're like, oh, my God, he's got Neil Armstrong on board. And, and so you just don't know. And you got to grasp those little things that, that happen in life that and make them a positive. Make them a big positive. And, you know, the so problem, to, to correlate and come all the way around, maybe that's when you go and you make your very first landing to the gentleman that just got his private pilot certificate. He soloed at some point. That was a little achievement that was a major positive. Well, then he goes back into the doldrums of life and the training, thinking, God, this is never going to happen. Well, he just got his private pilot certificate. Hooray! That's a huge positive. It's huge. Now he's going to go back into the doldrums of flying the pattern and, you know, getting himself better. And it's so, it just becomes stagnant again. But hopefully he'll he'll stay fired up and go get another rating. Uh, you know, five years from now, maybe he's got himself an airplane that he's landing on mountaintops or wherever he may be taking his lovely girlfriend to breakfast, which he can't do, to, you know, two weeks ago, which it's a big deal. And so you got to you got to uh, grasp on all those and, and look at every positive as, as something bigger than it is and keep expanding on it. I love it. I mean, the problem for this show is that uh, you're on it now. So I've peaked. So there's no <laughs> I'm on it. The ratings are probably going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> So much people are calling me a bully. I'm like a bully. You don't even know. <laughs> Come fly with us. I'm no bully. <laughs> but I, but I, I call, uh, I cow, I call cow stuff where it walks. And I, you know, uh, there's no gray area in life. It's black and white. And if you live in any sort of gray area, bad things happen. It's black and white. Live black and white. I'm really good at at putting my mouth or foot in my mouth on a daily basis. I'm really good at at saying way too much, but I'm at that point, too, where I've seen a lot, a lot of people injured, maimed, killed, you name it. I've lost a lot of really good friends. These people that are on the back of my walls back here, some of my very best friends that, that have passed away that are, that are inspirational to myself. And, you know, you got to play smart and, and you just you got to live and breathe the moment and, and, and look for the good in all things. And, and so, you know, we're all living the dream. I love it, man. No, I mean, it is. I mean, it, I think we were talking about Eric Farewell before, but he, the, I think what you're hitting at is like, Living the dream, and then, like, he had this quote, he said something about, like, what we're doing is superhuman. Yeah. Right? Like, it just, it's like, this is, inc like, the fact that we can do this, or even think about do this, or learn to do this at all, is just yeah. totally, totally, in by the way, it's resonating huge in the chat. People are, like, at one point, someone called for an amen, and, like, 20 people said amen. This, I just saw, this is not a Moscow mule, this is water. <laughs> You know, it's funny. My wife drinks all her water through a copper cup like that, too. I don't know. It must be that something about it. My wife got these. I mean, the chocolate Santa shows up every day. Amazon Prime, free shipping. 
Like, what did we get today? Well, we got these fancy little <laughs> copper cups. You know, Chocolate Santa drives up. Here's your fancy copper cups. But I'm drinking some water. <laughs> Rock on. Okay, so let's talk about Superhuman. And, and you talked about safety. And I think, I think that, like, I, what I'd like to do is just, you sent a couple of videos to kind of tee up. I want to talk a little bit about the stole flying some more. And I think what I'm interested in is talking about, like, you do this. Let me see if this works. We can keep talking while, like, this is a thing you guys just did. Yeah, this uh, this actually, that photo you showed earlier where we're sitting on that mountaintop up there around 10,000 feet, this is the departure. It's a hang glider takeoff. Uh, Bill Holmes on the right, Bruce Graham on the left in his new carbon cub. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a timing thing. This, this whole idea with, you know, all these cameras and things going. I did a video on my YouTube channel not too long ago about there's way too much going on. But it also, you can capture the moment. You know, social media is horrible with all this other stuff mm -hmm. that we have now. But the other side of the coin is that it's a huge positive because there's so much that you can inspire folks with and show what you're doing and share it with the world and get them motivated to do such. But that picture in particular, we're taking off there on that hang glider uh, departure out there. We called it Cub Cross Ridge, which has another story in itself. I don't mean to go on and on about, you know, all these various tangents, but we're flying around and... I've flown that area for 20 some years and there's all these white crosses that sit up there. And these guys found it as I was sitting on another peak after they took off. They said, oh, wow, look at all these crosses. And I went over and found us a landing. We landed up there and it was a new spot for us. And there's all these crosses that sit up there. We've come to learn that a local fellow had buried uh, the story behind it. He buried his family uh, and put crosses up there in memory of all of them. And I don't know much more of that story, but that's kind of why the crosses were there. And, but anyway, that photo in particular is where we're taking off off that ridgeline. So I guess the the thing that I'm curious about is I so let's let's dig into CFI Kevin for a second. And I want to say obviously like uh, you're you're a flight instructor, but you're not giving flight instruction right now. Uh, you yeah, should it's, go. It's <laughs> not <with> it. <laughs> I am tomorrow morning. Yeah, so it's like so just to be clear, like if you guys want to do this, go get some real instruction. Don't just like listen to what we're talking about and go jump off a mountain. But like the when I look at a video like that, or like here's another one you sent, like, uh, and I I think about as a Cessna pilot who's well quite out of currency right now, thanks to a number of things. Uh, but when I like, what can I if I'm like, hey, you know, someday I want to trade in this 172 for a, a Super Cub or something. What are things I can be doing now uh, to to help me get to that goal? of being able to do, I mean, like that cliff dive, I called it cliff dive. You said it was a hang, hang glider departure. Like, how do I, like, get to the point where, I mean, other than coming to learn, right? Like, what what can I do now to get to that point, to work towards honestly, that point? Honestly, Ryan, whether you're flying a 172, 152, 150, 170, 206, whatever your airplane is and wherever your skill set is, and I see it on a daily basis, Every time I give a BFR, I ask the guy, when's the last time you stalled your aircraft? Oh, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't stalled my aircraft since the last time I flew. Power and energy management, understanding slow flight and its capabilities, understanding your MCA, your minimum controllable airspeed, understanding where you hit that point in, in your flying. And obviously an airplane will always stall at the same angle of attack, but it'll stall at different airspeeds based on the different weight configurations and whatnot that you have in your aircraft. And so to be able to fly as much as you possibly can, understand the, the characteristics of your airplane and all of the, the flight attitudes, be it the slow flight, uh, the steep turns, you name it, you got to understand it and you got to be able to feel that aircraft. And then you always come back to the runway. I, I, it drives me nuts seeing somebody in a pattern that looks like it's a pattern of a 747. And you see these sure. young CFIs that – you know, kudos to them for taking on the responsibility to teach someone how to fly. And and this is where the bully and Kevin comes out because they're doing their students a disservice if that student were to pull their power and they can't make it back to the runway because they're going to learn what they're being taught in the infancy. That's their foundation. You can't build a house without a foundation. So to come back to your question, what you could be doing now is, is understanding the characteristics of your airplane, how it performs, spot landings. Most people are landing these 172s on a four, five, six, eight thousand foot runway. Right. You got thousand foot markers. 
There's no reason to hit the threshold for whatever reason. If something happens, you come up short, bad things can happen. But you got 1,000-foot markers. You've got good aiming points in the middle of the runway. Maybe you're on a runway that doesn't have 1,000-foot markers, but you've got some sort of mark out there. Maybe you got to put a damn traffic cone out there so that you have a spot. But pick a spot on the runway Hold airspeed through pitch. You know, pilots are really lacking proficiency on a slip, and they're afraid mm -hmm. to slip their aircraft. You could do this every day in your 172 where you have real good numbers in your pattern, and I'm not talking 90, 80, 70. We're slowing that aircraft down to where you've got a nice high sink. You can glide to the runway always. You can hit your 1,000-foot markers or your spot landing, whatever it may be that you've chosen and designated. And you can flare to slow that speed down with power and energy management. You bring up the pitch, you slow down, but you know where it's going to stall. The airplane will talk to you. It'll get sluggish. The roll rate will sluggish. It'll buff it. It'll shake all before the stall. And you don't need a stall horn to tell you that it's blaring in your ear, that you're getting close. But, you know, those are great. Whether you use an AOA or stall indicator, it doesn't matter. Pick your landing. Pick your spot. Nail your spot. Nail your numbers. As I was saying, pilots forget how to slip. And they've got this real nice slip going. Now they correct with the rudder. The nose drops. And they build all this airspeed back up. And they're doing 20 mile an hour faster than they wanted on touchdown. Sure. Which it's just not acceptable to where if they just go out and practice and train some proficiency, it's going to go a long way. I just did this thing with the AOPA Safety Institute, Richard McSpadden, and, and the real deal was that we were all talking about what's going on this summer in particular. Well, we're under this, if you want to call it a pandemic, you know, we don't need to get into that conversation whether you believe it or not, but we're under this craziness with COVID, and so... People are out of work. The kids are out of school. It's going to be this way for a little bit. And these pilots are jumping in airplanes because they're having to work. They're doing all their jobs, trying to just make ends meet. Maybe they're laid off. Maybe they can't afford to go fly. And then all of a sudden, they get this opportunity to go fly. Well, they haven't been proficient. They haven't been training. They haven't been mm -hmm. practicing all this stuff we just talked about. They load their airplane up. Now it's almost to gross. They've got full fuel. And they want to go fly in the Idaho, Nevada, the Alaska, the Montana backcountry. There's density altitude, they're not proficient like we were just saying, and they go in, they come to their spot, they try to attempt to go around, and they end up in the trees. And that's happening like crazy this summer. Or they're coming into a landing because all their buddies are there and there's the peer pressure, you know, Kodak Courage and the world-famous internet now, everybody wants to be on it. And they come into that landing too fast, and they end up flipping their aircraft. Or, again, something bad happens. And so I just say with good prior preparation, good prior training and proficiency, you'll have a good experience, odds are, because we all want that good experience. But the harsh reality is that if you don't have good preparation and good planning and good proficiency, that experience that you don't want is probably going to happen. And I, I can't beat that in enough. I mean, talking about safety isn't cool, right? Well, it really is cool. It's cool to be proficient. It's not cool to not be a proficient and load up your family in your grocery getter for the weekend and go fly somewhere when you haven't flown yourself for a couple weeks. I'll give you an example. I've been flying my carbon cub like crazy, and the poor 180s over there throwing empty beer bottles at me because <laughs> I'm flying it. You know, he's like, come over. So, okay, I got you. I'm coming over to the wagon. I'm going to park the carbon cub for a little bit. I get in the wagon. I haven't flown it for four weeks. I go to my buddy Merrick Turner's strip. Well, it's the cool approach is to come over the 150-foot trees and land in the middle of the strip and shut down. Well, guess what Kevin does? He comes over the top of the trees on his first landing because I haven't flown it in four or five weeks. Feels great in the air. Well, here comes the landing. It's 1030 in the afternoon. It's about 8,000-foot density altitude. I have this beautiful slip coming to the runway. Oh, my God, the sink. I try to arrest with power. Bang! And I'm 10 feet in the air, and I had power, and I was lucky. And I was lucky to go home. And I thought, gosh darn it, Quinter, you need to be proficient in this aircraft. You need to fly this aircraft more. The Carbon Cub is your little motorcycle, the wagon's your grocery getter. But the wagon's really what taught me off airport flying. It's what I took all of my ratings in. And it's, it's an airplane that I fly that usually that fits like a glove. But on this day in particular, being what I'm saying here, I wasn't proficient in my aircraft that day. And had I taken off and just done two or three takeoffs to landings before I went in to go over and slip over the 150-foot trees, 
to try to make this little 800 foot strip at 8,000 feet what was I thinking? And so it goes back to, you know, those that are watching and my message is the proficiency. If you're not proficient, it's going to lead to that experience that you're not looking for. And so, you know, it just hammered it in when I'm always trying to say to people, go out and fly your airplane and be proficient. you got to be proficient. And so, you know, luckily that photo you showed a little bit ago, there was three of me. Now I have three airplanes, and so each guy can fly one at each time. So, you know, I'll stay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much in there. And I think also you mentioned, like, due to COVID, right, like it's it's putting us into a different situation as pilots. And, and uh, I just – to speak truth to what you're saying, like uh, my, my dad's getting old and, and we're uh, trying to help him realize a dream right now of having a, a boat. We found a sailboat up in northern Wisconsin that we were going to go look at for him. And I was like, you know, like I got a way to get up there fast. Yep. And there was this moment where I was like, well, if I just go to the airport and like pound out my three takeoffs and landings so I'm passenger legal – and then like swoop us up to northern Wisconsin, like I'll be the hero of the day. And I hadn't yeah. talked to you yet or heard this idea of like the good experience, but like that was it. That was like you know I don't know what shoulders the good or the bad one, but like the idea right. of like well what's gonna happen if it gets even like a little hard because you haven't flown in, in I well I haven't flown in months right and yeah. so I need to get back into that proficiency before I can have those good experiences so i i'm tracking with you 100 percent component in too you know throw a little yeah, bit absolutely. of oh my gosh i've ended now it's blowing 18 yeah. left quartering left right quartering you name it you know you got to be yeah. proficient you got to pick your battles but you got to train to be proficient yeah 100 percent. okay so number one thing if we want to be a super awesome flying cowboy someday is just like go fly a ton go fly Go fly. Everybody, you know, we have our crew of flying cowboys that I feel very I'm humbled to be part of the likes of the Mike and Mark Patys, the Steve Henrys, Trent Palmer, our crew, you know, Hal Stockman, the most famous man that's not on the Internet, you know, Scott Palmer, our crew, they're, I'm inspired by those. Mark, Mark and Mike Patey are, are unlike anybody we've seen in my lifetime. I mean, Mike Patey broke – Howard Hughes, land speed, your transcontinental record, what he's doing, you know, with aircraft builds. I mean, we're watching a modern day Howard Hughes, and, and so I love to be part of that. But, you know, it's just, I lost my trend of thought there. It's, somebody is asking, let's talk about the Stearman. <laughs> so, 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 and I was like, hang on, guys. So, okay, so let's, let's, I wanted I to do. I can't look at the questions. I got to turn this down. <laughs> no, you should see how distracted I get. Okay, so I wanted to do one other thing, though, before we go to the Stearman. And that is, you sent me this video, an over-the-shoulder video of you coming into a strip. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to kind of, like, narrate that for us to give folks an idea of, like, what is going through your head as you're doing some of these off-airport landings. Would that be okay? Would that... Absolutely, yeah. I'm, yeah. Sp I'm springing that on you, but... No, bring it. Here. There you oh, it's oh, me. This is, this is actually one of my favorite spots. I just, I just convinced my wife to go up there. This is Marlet Peak above uh, Lake Tahoe. It sits at 9,000 feet, right at eight, right at 8,800 feet on the upper right. And at this point in particular, I've been in there so much, and I'll just, as if it was my first time, I've done a flyby, I've made to sure, understand where my touchdown application and my point is. And now power and energy management's critical. I don't want to be too fast. I don't want to be too slow. You get to a point of no return where you can't turn right to get out. Now hold my airspeed, hold my airspeed, it's uphill, start to flare, bring in just a bump of power, here's my touchdown, boom, I touch down, bring the power back, the sticks back, and ease onto the brakes, roll out about 150 feet, and look back at the spot and taxi over and get out and take a picture. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Thanks is, for doing there's that. There's so much that goes into that because... A, there's I can't tell you how many times I've gone into this spot. It's where I go up and drink coffee. I mean, it's a 10-minute flight from my home airport here. And I'll go up there. There's a lot of times where the wind at the airport is dead calm. But the airport's at 6,000 feet. You go up 3,000 feet, and it's blowing 25. And so wind in the mountains is like water in a river. There's rotors. There's eddies, updrafts, downdrafts, you name it. 
And so you get on this approach at about two miles out and you're feeling the airplane. And there's days where you're getting sure. rocked around and you just you immediately know this isn't the time and you're out. But then there's other times where, man, the wind's just off your nose and you feel like a helicopter and it's feeling really good. You get to that point that's the point of no return. Well, all right, I'm committed. That's when the last degree of flaps, number three, comes in. And I can get in with a little power, hold it, but I always try to stay high enough that I know at that point I'm going to make it because if there's an engine quit, bad things can happen and you can't go right and you're too slow. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in the high approach. Obviously, every landing differentiates whether you're going to drag it in or a high approach. But these kind in particular, you got to have a high approach, but you got to have it enough because it's an upslope landing to where you come in and then you can fly uphill to touch down. Oftentimes, people use that high approach. They run out of energy and they power it in and smack mm. and bad things happen. And so there is a technique to where you come in, you start low and come up. But again, that high approach, nice and stable, and you've come through the commitment Okay, I can let the nose drop, I can build a little airspeed because I know I'm going to make it, add a little power and touch down. And even if I didn't add a little power, I'd make it. And so having, having common sense, having, uh, having good faith in your mechanic and the maintenance that you take care of your aircraft, that's a whole other conversation. But I'm big on changing my oil every 25 hours, pulling the cowling, looking at all the things that are going on in my aircraft. You know, this type of flying we do, it's not a matter of if. It's when every single day we have things that happen to folks in these aircraft and, and you got to do everything you can to make sure all the boxes are checked, all your I's and T's are dotted and crossed to where you're going to make it. Coming up short's not an option. And I've got a family and, and, you know, it's important again to go back to the proficiency. I wouldn't just go out and go land up there had I not been flying. And so, you know, I've been flying there. I go there every single day. I know the characteristics of it. I enjoy bringing people up there getting out on the radio, coaching them in, you know, it's all, it's, it's all part of it. If somebody's got a steep approach that's too steep or they're too low, I call them off and tell them to go around, come back, reset. You know, I can look at them and see whether they're going too fast or not. That runway up there that we call runway, the meadow, you've only got about 400 feet at 9,000 feet, but it's a every bit of an eight to 12% grade, which is literally going to diminish your rollout by gosh, almost half to two thirds. And so you get there and people think, God, you're landing that airplane in 100, 150 feet at 9,000 feet. Really? Well, you are because the, the energy management factor of just rolling uphill. And so, you know, you see in the video, I have to, I have, have to add power to, to taxi up and over. And so, you know, that's kind of what's going on through my mind as we go up into that. Okay. So people are still asking for the steerman. So let's, <laughs> I could, I want to talk about this because I think it's so fascinating, but I do think there's something else fascinating to talk about tonight. And that is you recently acquired a Stearman, and I believe this is it. Oh, baby, that's my that's Jake right there. Love it. Beautiful, beautiful Stearman. Uh, and uh, lots of folks in the chat have been asking. I think 782 Papa asked this. A couple other people had asked this. I think they're really curious. I mean, we'll talk about the plane, and I want to talk about why biplanes but let's just real quick, because we were talking a little bit about flying the the stole stuff. How are you transitioning from something like the Carbon Cub, which has a lot of power and is very light, to something like a Stearman? So this the Stearman in particular, this one weighs just over 2,000 pounds. My Skywagon weighs just under 1,700 Believe it or not, the gross weight on this is 2950, just like my Skywagon. Got the big wing X and whatnot on my Skywagon, so it went from 2550 to 2950. I have the exact same useful load. Mm. Believe it or not, I, I trained in an N3N, a Navy biplane, which is about 800 pounds heavier. Uh, to back up now just a minute, I've had a Stearman literally hanging on my ceiling since I was a little boy. My grandfather built a balsa wood Stearman that my son now has hanging in his room uh, to this day. And I had this thing spinning above me. I stared at it my entire life. I love the lines of a Stearman. I love the nostalgia. And even more so, being a pilot, understanding why, you know, take it or leave it, there's a reason why we speak English and not German. This is the aircraft that trained thousands of our, children, of our, of our young men and boys to go over to Europe overseas and fight with our allied forces against the Germans. These kids would jump in this, they'd get 10 or 15 hours, 
and they would go across the pond and they'd get another 10, 15 hours in a P-51 or a P-40 or you name it. And now they're chasing the Falk Wolves or getting chased by. And this aircraft in particular, they made 10,000 of them. Um, and I just feel so lucky to be part of that aviation, you know, history. My dad always said you could fly with these old guys you know, for an hour and learn something. But if you can hang out with them and rub elbows with them for an hour, you're going to learn a lifetime of stories. And I'm, I'm inspired by them. I, I, it's a whole nother aspect of flying that I've looked at my entire life. Never in my wildest imagination did I think I'd have a steerman. I sold my heli ski operation. Oh, just this last spring. And, uh, I'm still part of that for a few more years, but literally I sold my heli ski operation and my wife was like, boy, you should get yourself a nice watch or, or something. I, watch? I, you gave me a Breitling for my 40th birthday. <laughs> Sweetie, I'm buying a biplane. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I moved to the hangar for about a week. But, you know, no, not in all seriousness, I had to have her on board. I had to have her support. I'm still gaining that support. Uh, but, you know, the opportunity that came from a, a friend of mine that, his name's Gary Peters up at Hangar 180 in Lewiston, Idaho. If everybody or anybody ever goes through Lewiston, go see Gary. He's he's my age. He's right around mid 40s, almost 50. He came into some money, you know, in the last 10 years to where now all of a sudden he's got B25s and P51s and 64s. He's he's got the oldest flying Ryan's in his aircraft. He's got the speed mail that that you flew in that you and I talked about. And he had this, and everything is original. He, he had this Stearman sitting in his hangar, and he knew I was going through this process. My buddy Kyle Bushman at Ragwood Refactory flies the N3N. My buddy Marcus Smith is flying uh, corporate, but he also has access to a Stearman. Of course, my story with the Stearman hanging in my in my ceiling there as a kid. I've just always had this, this man, the Stearman and the history. I love the lines and, and what goes with it. And so I thought, well, I got to get serious. I need to go fly an N3N. I saw my buddy Andy Bibler at Lincoln. If anybody ever wants an opportunity to get trained in a biplane, Andy does a great job. I'm actually going to go get checked out in his T6 here next in a couple weeks because my big factor is that I want to go fly heavy iron airplanes, which is a whole other story in itself, staying focused on the steerman and the biplane. I flew this N3N. Man, it's it was one of the heaviest sticked airplanes I've ever felt flying. It's almost two-handed and You've got controls over. You can see my YouTube channel where I make this progression of, you know, my biplane journey. And I'm just now finishing my number three with the Stearman training, and then it'll be number four with mine. But you can see the, the most recent on my YouTube channel. But this big box is sitting there on my left knee. Crosswinds are a handful in these things. It's very, very real. And it's left aileron, right rudder, and I can't get the aileron over because this box is in the way, and i got to figure that out. This big muscly airplane, well, five hours, I think I did 100 and some landings in the thing, and, and finally got it to where I was checked out. I can get on Andy's insurance now, and I can go fly the thing, and, man, that was awesome. So I come home, man, where am I going to find a steerman? i got to fly a steerman because I, I need to have an educated approach. I Going back to this whole early in our conversation, Ryan, about if you want to do something, immerse yourself in it. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. I, I immersed myself in like, all right, I got to be educated. I just can't go out and I got this little bit of money. It's not going to last forever. This is this is what I've got, and I don't want to be silly. So I went and found my buddy Chris Miller at uh, oh um, sure Columbia Airport, and Chris is a is a guy that's flown. 100 plus Stearman. He's got thousands of hours in these Stearman aircraft. And so I go see Chris, and next thing you know, I've learned more in a day flying with Chris than I've learned in the last 10 years flying this Stearman aircraft. And it reminded me a cross between the Skywagon and the Cub, believe it or not. It's still a sporty aircraft on landing, especially in crosswinds. But now, fast track forward, I was able to meet this fella Gary who got wind that I was looking for a steerman because, you know, I don't post very much on the internet and I'm posting this. I'm looking for a I think I want a steerman. Well, Gary, come to find out, Gary and I were talking about doing stole drag at Lewiston for Rivers and Radials a summer or two ago. And so it just kind of came full circle. He's like, Kevin, I've got this steerman that, you know, I'm not really interested in selling it, but everything I have is early so the steerman came in 1939 it started with the pt-17 it went through the pt series then it went through the uh the s series the one the two the three well i have the n2s-3 which is the 1944 model they made 1700 of them and so 
He said, Kevin, I got a line on a 39 because as you can see in this hangar, everything I have is immaculate. It's, they're all museum pieces. They're, they're museum pieces that fly. And he's got this supporting cast that takes care of all of them. His, uh, his Czech pilot, Jared Sigrid, who checked me out in it, is an amazing individual. I didn't know anything from him other than the fact that he was the Czech guy for all these warbirds. So I immediately had like, wow, he's, how old are you? He's about 35. He's an ag pilot. Started talking with folks that knew Jared, and Jared had this incredible amounts of uh, of knowledge before I even showed up meeting him. Where I just I knew this guy was he's the guy I got to go fly with up there, and so Jared ended up checking me out in this steerman. Excuse me, because Gary is getting this uh, 1939 model steerman, which whatever mm. end number it is, you know, within the top 20, early early first ever. And he said, Kevin, with what you're doing with aviation and all of the above and how you're looking for the steerman, you ought to come see me. And so this is pre-even telling my wife that I was going to buy it because I wasn't really sure. Well, I kind of knew. I kind of had it in my head like, oh, my God, Gary, and I've heard about this hangar. <laughs> and it just kind of worked out that I knew Gary. I was going to Idaho anyway for this AOPA safety seminar at Smiley Creek. And the night before, I called Trent because we were going to take my 180 Trent I need you to fly us, buddy. And then we're going to Lewiston afterwards. So I think Lewiston's in the southwest corner of Idaho. True story. Well, we come to find out Lewiston is two hours from Smiley Creek, and it's in the northwest corner. <laughs> Trent looks at me and goes, Quinn, where are you taking me? Are we going to Canada? I mean, we can see Washington. We can see Canada. It's Lewiston, it felt like it was on the northwest corner of, of Idaho. So we get out, and lo and behold, you know, I get there, and they're out there, and they – they throw me in at the sun setting. It's getting dark, and Gary and Jared are like, hey, we're going flying. If you watch Trent's video and me picking it up, you can kind of see where it's sunset. It's getting dark. I'm in. I'm putting my goggles on. You know, my goggles are crooked. They're putting my seatbelt on, and they're starting the engine. This is how you work the radios. And I, I just hold on, time out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're like, no, we need to go. And next thing you know, we're taxiing, we're flying, we're doing loop de loops and barrel rolls. We come back and land, and my mind is like, my mind is blown. This is the aircraft I have to have because it's incredible. And uh, my training started the next morning, as did my long and lengthy phone calls with my beautiful wife. <laughs> um, sweetheart, you don't understand this opportunity because Gary's telling me, you know, people are like, if Gary tells you this, this is the real thing. Gary's like, Kevin, you get 100, 150 hours, you got to come back because you can fly the mustang you know the pilot you are the tailwheel experience you have you can come get checked out in the p40 p64 you got to come in when hinton's coming up to fly the b25 you got to come i'm like oh my god if i blow this opportunity sweetie well there's always a good deal honey you're gonna find another good no you don't understand there's an opportunity here this is an opportunity i can't pass up yeah there's a good deal there's always opportunities well Guess what? I flew the steerman home, and now it's in my hangar. Now we got almost 40 hours. We've got 350 some landings. I don't have enough smoke. I just ordered a 50 gallon drum of smoke, 55 gallon drum of smoke, because I fly with my buddy uh, Grant K and Court Levy right now, who are world famous photographers for my ski business. They come to High Sierra and take photos and whatnot. Some of these photos are theirs, actually. That's Trent's right there. But you know, I'm I'm flying around with these guys, and, and all they're saying is. Put the smoke back on so we're flying the steerman all over tahoe with the smoke on that's my buddy court in the front seat from the day before yesterday and it's i'm so inspired by it if you can't tell by my voice this is kind of how i am anyway but i'm so <laughs> i'm so i'm so inspired by this airplane and the history it has every time i get in it it gets i get chills talking to you to where i wonder how many kids flew in this aircraft and went to war I wonder how many kids flew this aircraft, learned how to fly in this aircraft, and didn't come back from war. I wonder, in looking through the logs of the people that owned this aircraft, and now to look, man, I just want to take people flying. Now, somebody reached out to me on the Stearman forum because now I'm, I'm there posting. I said, sorry, I don't mean to blow up this page. This is just incredible. You guys need to post more pictures. I want to see yours, too. And I want to learn from these guys that have been flying these aircraft. And, and it goes back to that story I said a little bit ago. I just want to sit at a coffee table for five minutes and listen to, to two days worth of stories from these guys that are, you know, 80, 90 years old that learn how to fly these things because they're going away. And if, if we don't capture that from them, the stories are going to get changed and the stories are going to get rewritten. And it's just another part of aviation that, oh, I'm so reinvigorated, if that's even a word. It's... Uh, it, it's just awesome. And this airplane that we call Jake, 
is, you know, it's got the 275 horsepower Jacob engine on the front, and uh, it doesn't carry enough smoke, <laughs> but it's just awesome. And then you get this whole other aspect of the radial. I just, I've had limited knowledge, and so I've immersed myself. I'm reading books on radial engines, and I'm asking all these guys, you know, some of these poor fellows just might think, who the heck is this guy? But if you get to know me, I, I become a thorn in your side until such time as I understand it. And I want to understand it as good as they do, if not better. I mean, just, I, you know, hearing myself talk is kind of funny about, you know, going through the series of, of Stearman. But I've immersed myself in this education to learn and understand it. And uh, somebody told me, they said, you know, it's against the rules to ever have an empty bucket. And I'm like, what do you mean? What's an empty bucket? the front seat dummy and <laughs> oh yeah it's against the rules to ever have an empty front seat so I, I wake up in the morning who wants to go fly in the steerman and and uh my buddy court and grant i've spent so much time in aircrafts with him I, I called court the other day i'm like buddy i like having you in the front seat you're like my you're like my my blanket my my easy blanket you feel so good to have up there but i'm taking <laughs> these guys now that i've got some hours and i'm i'm coming up like i say i'm just shy of 50 hours now in the damn thing and i've got 40 something and uh, umpteen dozen landings, you know. So now I'm going to start branching out and taking other folks to fly because I'm feeling pretty good in it. And, again, every landing that my, my buddy Kyle Bushman reminds me of is that every landing in this Stearman in particular, and I never understood this until, until I flew it. I always thought it's just another airplane. Great, I'll be able to fly. Well, sit somewhere and literally you can't see a thing like the the sight picture is nothing you look out your side you use your peripheral if you lean well the airplane's going to go where you lean and so that's a whole nother discussion on that sight picture it's crazy and so it's the real deal kyle told me he says it reminds you that it can literally take your tailwheel endorsement away from you on every single landing and it is very, very real. You still have the common knowledge of the power and energy management. You slip to every landing, hold that airspeed, kick the rudder, keep it straight, and now you're just hanging on hoping that you're going to grease it and keep it straight. And if you have a little bit of a wind, oh, my. And I'm that guy still at the pilot where I lick my, oh, gosh, it's windy. We're not flying <laughs> because that's, that's, that's real. The steerman is real. And, and so that envelope is starting to expand. And, and again, that goes back. This all correlates to training, preparation, proficiency. I'm flying it every single day right now, an hour to two hours every day. I try to go out and make as many landings as I possibly can. And I, you know, I'm increasing my wind. I'm increasing my crosswinds. Bring it on. I want to be as good as I can in that thing so that I can give good rides to people, keep them safe, and, and hopefully inspire the, inspire others. And, and that's really – that's my Stearman story in a nutshell. I love it. I love it. And I, I think uh, I think the gravity of it, right, the gravity of the aircraft, I, that, I, that just hits me, right? Like I think – uh, we talked a little bit, I and people who watch the show know that I, I did my primary training in J3 Cubs, and you and I had this, like, kind of, like, similar moment when we talked on the phone the other day about, like, you know, when you put your hand on a J3, you have that same of that same thing, right? You're like, yeah. oh, man, this thing's, well, ancient, one. But two, like, J3s were, like, the step before the step that you're at right now in terms of that, World War II pilot training, and I, I maybe it just means I'd need more time in J threes, but I felt the way that you feel about the, <laughs> the tailwheel landings and that, like as a young, not young person, but as a, a newer student, right? Like it just felt like I never really knew exactly what it was going to do to me, and that's a fairly docile aircraft, right? Like yep. as far as tailwheel goes, so I can it just resonates with me. It's like, yeah, I think I don't know, maybe we should get someone to keep making steermen so we can there's nothing like it you know i a tailwheel is a tailwheel aircraft somebody always says you know how long does it take to become you know a tailwheel pilot well how long did it take you to solo some guys solo in six seven hours some solo mm -hmm. in 20 it doesn't matter how long it takes you to solo same with the tailwheel i get people all the time how long is it going to take me how much is it going to cost to train me to tailwheel well we're going to get to that point we're going to have a conversation we want to make sure you feel comfortable then we're going to send you around the patch, and you're going to go do your three takeoffs and landings to a full stop. That might be three or four hours. It might be 10 hours. I'm not interested in, in milking another dollar out of you to, to, 
say that I need to make more money. It's, it's about keeping you safe and training you. And the first mm-hmm. thing I do before someone starts tailwheel stuff or we talk about it, I'm like, all right, here's the deal. Every time you go to the grocery store, yeah, you got to go to the grocery store, not just your wife. You got to go with her. And you got to push the cart, push the cart backwards. So you push the grocery cart backwards, what happens? It wants to swap ends on you. You're not allowed to let it swap ends. Push that whole golf cart or that grocery cart around the whole store. Fill your groceries in. The heavier it gets, the easier it wants to swap ends. True story with the tailwheel aircraft. And so all of you guys that are out there watching, go shop with your wives. Let her fill up as much as she wants. The heavier that grocery cart gets, the harder it's going to be to control pushing it backwards. And it's kind of cool because it creates cool conversation. You know, I don't like to talk very much. <laughs> and so, <laughs> wait, what? The store, and I still to this day, you know, I push the, go- the grocery cart backwards, and people are like, why are you pushing that grocery cart backwards? I get a weird look. It's, oh, it's tailwheel training. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's reality. That's honest. <laughs> and then they're like, what's a tailwheel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You sent a super. You sent a, a super cool video on a play before we wrap it up for the night, uh, of you flying along a river here. I think with that too small smoke. I got we got a I got a couple guys from my flying club in the in the chat. We should get a, a smoke oil tank for uh, for uniform Victor. All right, here we go. Let me see if this works. There we go. Yeah, like that's like that's so epic, man. This is that Insta360 cam, and, and I mean, it's just, I mean, smoke. I'm trying to save it because at this point, I think, I don't know how much I have left, I, and my drum hasn't shown up yet. I think it came today, and, and so I think you see me running out of smoke here a little bit, but just to go down that channel and uh, smoke on, I mean, I'm not going to do it if there's fishermen or boats in there. I don't really want to be that guy. I mean, I will be that guy every now and then, but you got to remember about your regulations. You're not buzzing people and all that kind of stuff, you know, to make sure that people understand that. I'm not just this flying cowboy that that goes out and does such things, but here, given the airspace and the remote proximity of this reservoir, you can fly low. We land on all these beaches all the time. And uh, I love going down that channel with the idea that if something did happen, I could make a turnover, land on the beach or what have you. But, you know, smoke on and, and having that smoke just being able to pull up and, and hit that button and see the smoke. The other cool thing, coming back to a runway, you can come through, lay low, do a pass with smoke on, come back out, and now you're entering the pattern again for, you know, short approach, and the smoke's still sitting on the runway or it's drifting a little left. And so now I have this built-in wind detector, which is like a cheater system. I dig it. Who needs the... The G3X, it tells you what the wind's doing. You just need a smoke system. Hit the button, and you can see what it's doing. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> I think when I'm president of the world, I'm just going to mandate that every aircraft needs a smoke system. Uh, every one. Every like, single aircraft. I want one on all my aircraft. You should see the smoke system that Kyle Bushman put on his uh, Experimental 175, and he's giving me a hard time. He's like, we need to upgrade your smoke system, but... You can go see Kyle Bushman on any of the platforms. Look what he's doing with his N3N and his, his 175, and he, he, he like, blows up the valley with smoke. And, you know, there's a there's a time and a place for it, for sure. Yeah, it's funny a, because – go ahead. I was going to say, you have a smoke system on your paramotor? Got to do that. Yeah, yeah. Eric Farewell, if you're watching, I need a smoke system on my paramotor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to. That's – yeah, you got to do it. So – so, so I think though, like, kind of going back to the beginning of it, right? Like the transition to this was pretty, and, and we're way over time. So if you gotta hop off, let me know. <laughs> but the transition to this, it sounds like it was. I mean, you're you're doing the responsible thing, and because I, I guess here's what I would say as the as the novice pilot, I would assume that. I think it sounds like incorrectly. By the time I've got as many hours, as much experience as you. That I could just hop into that thing, and like figure it out. And and I, I I've learned over the last couple of years that I don't think that's true. And it sounds like you. <laughs> I thought that and boy, I, taking that first ride around the patch was like doing my first solo all over again. Sweaty palms, and I won't lie. If you know, if the wind's blowing and here comes the landing, I got damn it, I got sweaty palms again. It's real. That thing is next level. I get back in the 180 or the Cub, and it's like driving a, no disrespect to the Nosewell pilots, but it's like flying a Landomatic again. Like, oh yes, this is this is where it's at. 
and it, it's very, very, very real, you know. And, and like I say, I don't mean that as a disrespect to the nose wheel because the nose wheel is so much different than, than conventional gear where that tail wants to swap ends on you. I flew a nose wheel forever, and it's a great aircraft. And, you know, to give the Cub Crafters plug, they've got that new NX Cub with the nose wheel, which is awesome. And it, it just provides another level of safety. And so, damn, I wish the Stearman had a nose wheel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Not in real. the in, in the interest of of uh, getting us out the door, even though unless you're ready to go, I'm sure you've got like dinner or something. You give some of your kids. Uh, what I was gonna say is we could just keep. The, it could go for the longest uh, conversation record tonight. <laughs> if we're breaking records, let's do it. Yeah, dude, we're over. I think we might already be there. It's somewhere between you and Elliot Segwin. You guys are both very passionate. I don't know if you've ever talked to him before. Uh. <laughs> You should check him out. Fuck so, him up. See what kind of conversations we can have. Yeah, well, he, he, he's. I think the two of you are probably like the most passionate people in aviation, <laughs> for sure. So I do this thing on this show called Short Final, where we put 60 seconds on the clock. I ask you a bunch of random questions uh, about aviation. You just give me answers, and we just... We just figure out some stuff. And I got some over here. Can I, just, can I get to give a shout out? Because I see him commenting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I a, but I look forward to meeting him just plain silly. I watched his deal from the AC Awards at Stearman Field. And mm-hmm. I love that he thought everybody was the FAA and getting after him. And, like, I just got to give him a plug because I see him commenting. And I thought that uh, that video was was awesome. Like, two thumbs up and a toe. Like, it was awesome. <laughs> Dude, Brian is the best. Uh, he's he. So I would probably rather end up with a Stearman or a Cub. He's pushing me to a Grumman because he's oh. got a Grumman. Uh, awesome. Br- Brian Wolfacorn, another YouTuber, has a Grumman. And then I would be Ryan with a Grumman. So we'd be like the little Grumman gang yeah, showing awesome. up to places. I don't know. Uh, he, <laughs> of course, he just made his day. Ha, ha, ha. Thank you so humble. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just I think it's just awesome where you know everybody's out to get him he's stealing airplanes and just I I thought it was really cool because you see so much of the you know hello here I am and now we're gonna go do this and I thought that was really cool good job yeah dude that guy's awesome he was on the show if you guys haven't seen it I don't know a couple months ago Brian was on the show and we had a blast and then I was actually uh, on his show uh, trying to pretend to be uh, anything. Anyway, Any- all right. <laughs> let's let's play, let's play some short final where I'm going to put my epic music on. We've got to hit our timer. It's so professional. All right, Kevin Quinn, most underrated stole airplane. Oh, let's go with uh, Murphy Rebel. Oh, there you go. Favorite landing spot of all the landings you've ever done. There's, there's so many. I love Marlette. I love coming around the corner at Oshkosh, landing in front of all those folks. Soldier Bar is probably one of my favorite in Idaho because you come around the corner, four-mile approach, and it's like landing on an aircraft carrier. Rock on. Okay. Uh, what about uh, favorite airplane you've ever gotten a ride in? Uh, P-51 Mustang. Favorite passenger you've ever had? My dad. Uh, favorite warbird that's not a steerman? Corsair. Ooh, that's the second time someone's answered that. I All will, right, I will have one one day if I have to sell everything I own. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. it. Goes back to our idea, conversational passion. All right, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious: aluminum or tube and fabric? Oh, tube and fabric, buddy, all the way. I knew. You're, I was. I didn't know with the Cessna if you were gonna go. Maybe certified you're... experimental. I'll go experimental every day of the week. Yeah, I mean, we but were talking about that Stearman, last week. My Stearman is certified tube and fabric. Go figure. And now, wait, is your have you done enough mods to your to your uh, Cessna that it's experimental now? No, uh, my Cessna certified. The Stearman certified. The Carbon Cub is a hermaphrodite of a Carbon Cub, which is another story in itself. But it's experimental, and you can do whatever you wish. The Stearman. Oh man, can you imagine a steerman on 35 inch bush wheels with a set of leading edge slats? I can. <laughs> I mean, you've. Uh, it's kind of the question I've been beating around the bush. Ha! Huh? Dead joke. Uh, <laughs> like, you need a drum. <laughs> I should. I'll get, I got one back here somewhere, actually. There it is. Uh, do, you, do you. 
I mean, I in some of the photos, it looks like you were off airport in it. Like, have you done yeah. anything like that with it yet? My, my first landing off airport was this field that looked perfectly mowed, and I had Jared on board, so I won't lie, I didn't go by myself there, but my first landing, and then we're circling above the Snake River, and there's all these beautiful benches, and we're circling, Jared's like, we should, all right, let's go back to there. No, we should go right here, and we should go land. He goes, you want to land there? I, Absolutely. And so that picture you saw a little bit ago, we're sitting in this field overlooking the Snake River. You know, it's just a steerman belongs in the off airport environment. It's it's an airplane that, you know, these young kids trained in fields before we had paved runways for crime any sake. And, you know, the harsh reality here with this steerman in particular, you'll you'll have it in here. It was one back in the sitting in the field. There you we know, go. There it is. I mean, that was literally my first I think that was landing number three or four, and this field had just been mowed and Snake River's there off the top side there behind the tail. It made for just an epic, epic photo and a, and a great spot. But, you know, this this thing is – it's such a beautiful steerman. It's so clean. I want to keep it that way. And I don't have any inclination of going out and beating it up. But I'm going to take it off airport a little bit. You know, it's begging for that. Old Jake wants to go to some cool places. I'm going to go land it up on top of Marlette overlooking Lake Tahoe at 9,000 feet and blow up the internet for sure. But, uh, you know, just because no one ever has. And, like, it's just like, are you kidding me to have that plane sit up there? And Yes, please. I just want the picture on my wall. That's all I really want. I don't even care if anybody else gets to see it. It's, uh, yeah, that airplane is screaming for some off-airport, but some smart off-airport because it's just too nice. It's too nice to beat it up. I'm not really interested in getting the rocks and whatnot through the tail feathers. This is the aircraft I'm going to teach my kids how to fly in. It's the aircraft that I'm going to give my kids uh, at some point, you know. And so it's the history that's with this and that goes into it. I'm going to take care of it. And, it, you know, to, to close on that note, when you come home in the carbon cub or the wagon, you push them into the hangar, and you say goodnight to it after you unload it. With the steerman, you push it away. And the guy that, you know, these guys are like, Kevin, they told me that. You push the Cub, you push the 180 in the hangar, you close the door, and that's kind of that. You come back the next day, put gas in it, go fly again after you check the oil. The Stearman, it's an 80-plus-year-old aircraft. Come land, come fly, put a half hour, put an hour into it after you fly, getting the oil off, cleaning it. I got a clean kit, hooking that up so it drains properly so I don't get a, a hydraulic lock. Make sure you got the smoke oil off it and... You go around because radials excrete oil everywhere. And so with as clean and as nice as it is, I owe it to everybody that's ever flown this aircraft, learned to fly this aircraft, went to war and fought with these. I owe it to all of them to make sure that I do my best to clean it. And if I can inspire those that I take flying, Court and Grant, I know you're flying, watching. <laughs> Every time we go, <laughs> we come back and we got to put into what it just gave us. It's that... It's that experience that you can't really summarize. There's no adjective to put on it. And we owe it to all of those and all that history to spend a half hour to an hour to keeping it clean and keeping it in the top shape that it's in. That, uh, I, that, I felt that way about the, even the J3s, right? It's like you're a custodian. And I think I think 72, yeah, so, someone said the same thing. You're only the, a current custodian. Yeah. Current custodian of such an airplane. <laughs> I'm the, I, I'm the caretaker of this aircraft now, and then if I can instill those uh, responsibilities into my children and hopefully keep it in our family, then, you know, they need to understand that, you know, there's a responsibility in owning this aircraft. It's not just like this airplane you're going to put gas in and go bounce around the mountains in. you got to come home and, and let, her, let them know that you appreciate all that's gone into it. And I'm so yeah. humbled by the whole thing, you know. It's, it's just – it's incredible. Well, this this show has been incredible, Kevin, and I want to. <laughs> hey man, I, I made it to Super Arrow Live. I'm so excited about it. It's yeah, awesome. dude, this has been awesome. This has been incredible. Uh, a couple people in the chat have said that you need to become a regular guest, and you. I'd be we'll, happy to join anytime you want if you'd have me. We'll we'll have to work out the contract, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> my people will call. My, I don't have any people. I'll call your people. Uh, <laughs> I have no people. I just have my wife. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, dude, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. This has been, this has just been absolutely incredible. I think, awesome. obviously, the you know we we talked we talked about a lot in the last 
last bit of the show, but I, I think the big thing that um, I appreciate just to get it out there is uh, all the work you're doing to promote safety and, and separately to make safety cool, right? I think yeah. that that's a thing that, that people, um, you see it at every airport, right? There's like the guy razzing people for making the right decision or the safe decision. And uh, the only way we can do cool stuff, like all the epic stuff that you're doing is by being attentive to that. So I just, I appreciate you towing that line of safety and, and being aggressive on that. I don't know. It, it just it's, it seems it's important. Super, it's super important. You know, you get these folks on the internet that you call them keyboard pilots or for whatever adjective you want to give them. But I grew up watching Dukes of Hazard, and to this day I still, you know, I don't run from the law and I don't jump my car over trains. Yeehaw. You know, I watch that on TV and, and – a lot of being a pilot, you, you got to have a little bit of common sense, too. My dad mm -hmm. always used to look at me, son, are you dumb or are you just plain stupid? <laughs> you know, it, you got to have some common sense and, and you can't fix you can't fix stupid. But you also got to be tactful and we've got to we've got to make safety cool because talking about is kind of boring and talking about safety is kind of just it's just what it is, you know. People are, mm -hmm. oh my God, here they go. They're talking about safety. Well, we can talk about safety because it's super cool to go out and train and slip the aircraft and stall the aircraft yeah. and and do all that kind of stuff that makes you proficient so that you have that good experience, you know. And, and so I think it's our duty for all of us as pilots, everybody watching. I challenge you to to engage with people at the airport in a in a silly manner in a fun way become passionate about what you're doing and how you're talking about it. And it'll resonate tenfold. You know, you tell two people, they tell two more and two more tell yeah. 10, 10 tell 200. And then all of a sudden doing it's pretty cool. But if you're the guy that, that hammers someone and is condescending and talking about it, that's not really cool. It doesn't go very far. And so at any rate, it's a personal passion and personal responsibility, you know, to talk about it and, I think it's fun to talk about it, man. Let's go out and stall the airplane. Yeah. Who want to go yeah. do that? Dude, I mean, uh, for folks at home, if you haven't slipped, like done like a real slip in your airplane, like, that's there's something fun about. Like I don't know, maybe it's on my J3 time, but like, you if you want to watch a cool slip, I mean, you can watch basically all of Kevin's videos. There's probably a slip oh. in every one. But uh, like I remember, some of my favorite pilot memories are being with pilots, like slipping it in, even in like an old Cessna. I don't know. Just go, go do that stuff. I'm gonna go do that stuff. You're inspiring me, Kevin. I'm gonna go. Yeah, so cool. All so right. much, so much fun. It's kind of like jumping a dirt bike. You jump a dirt bike, yeehaw! But now you get these guys that jump their dirt bike and throw them sideways, come back. Now you got these kids that throw and do backflips, one-handed grabbers. Well. I mean, there's so many things that you can do that are fun and entertaining, but also very safe that are challenging your skill sets. And mm -hmm. with anything, go to altitude to where you've got that minimum 1500 AGL for recovery. Get with somebody that you look up to, find a mentor to take you in your airplane if it's not comfortable for you to show you how to do this stuff and use that you know, hard deck at 2,000 feet AGL, so you've got a 500-foot buffer, build-in buffers, and it's fun doing that stuff. Safety's cool, and then come back to the airport and challenge yourself with the spot landing, the slip to the landing through power to energy management and slow flight and understanding your you know, minimum controllable airspeed, all that stuff. It's just, yeah. you know, that's cool. That's aviation. We're pilots. Yeah, I mean, it's like, how could you, I don't know. I don't know how it couldn't be cool. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Thanks so much, dude. This has been yeah, awesome. Buddy. I feel like yeah. I could talk to you for another hour, but, <laughs> but you, <laughs> it's it, it's late here, and it, you're probably got to go put the kids to bed. So I, anyway, I, yeah, that, I do. Thank you so so much. <laughs> man. Like two thumbs up to you and all your watchers and followers, and uh, you know, just keep doing the do, buddy. It's awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, and everyone else that's watched, uh, thanks so much, guys, for watching tonight. This has been a really, really cool, exciting show, and uh, I hope that uh, you guys learned something like I learned a lot tonight. And uh, tune in next week. Uh, I've got one guest who's on the deck, not quite confirmed, so I don't want to, like, out them, 
But uh, we will definitely have a show next week. It's going to be pretty cool if it all... Well, no matter what, it's going to be really cool. So make sure to mark your calendar. It'll be cool. And then uh, I was telling Kevin, I can't tell you guys, but I got, I'm having some like really serious emails with some really serious pilots about being on the show in September. So just uh, book, book out every Wednesday. It's going to be awesome. And I'm getting, I'm getting a little nervous. Getting a little nervous. But I'm not outing them just plain silly. I'm just, we're just going to... We're going to make sure it happens. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll catch you next week. Stay safe. Stay well. All that jazz. And uh, everyone go flying. I'm inspired. I got to go. I got to go flying.